Austin. Yes. Okay. <laughs> I thought that was really funny. It is a small world. Yeah. We did student government together. Okay. That's right. He's with NYPD now, but he was like... He's not um, the only one from SUNY Albany. He's <laughs> I bet. <laughs> So we don't have. Don't worry. So Josh, we don't have enough of a connection to. To go live. Hold on. Now it's working. I have to turn off the Wi-Fi. What about your Bluetooth? Councilor, do you have the moment? Good evening. Good evening. One more time. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you all for uh, coming out. I'm uh, Council Member Ben Kalos. Uh, you can tweet at Ben Kalos. Uh, this event is recorded every year. It's going to be up on YouTube. It's actually on Facebook live as we speak. So if anyone you know is able to join us uh, tonight, they are possibly watching at home as we speak on our Facebook page. Uh, so just please know that everything is being recorded. This is a public meeting and uh, you are welcome. I have the privilege of representing 168,000 people on the Upper East Side, Roosevelt Island, East Harlem, and East Midtown, as well as the greater city of 8.6 million people. I want to uh, thank everyone who uh, came out last week to vote in the primary elections. I believe three times, pe three times as many people voted this year than ever before. We broke, we shattered all sorts of records, and it was. Uh, absolutely amazing and uh, now we're looking at November as you look at November I hope that you will help me with something that I think is very important so uh, I guess I have a, a quick question for folks does anyone here feel like government doesn't always do what you want it to do I see a show of hands who <laughs> and does anyone ever feel like this neighborhood can feel a little bit crowded and that the building keeps coming no matter what we do. <laughs> and, and so does anyone, and, and so the city has something called campaign finance. That's where elected officials have to get money from folks when they run. When I ran, I got, I believe, 4,000 contributions, and they were very small contributions. That's why I needed so many of them. Uh, where do folks get their money from when they're running? Feel free to yell out. It's okay. Really? So, so I heard real estate, and, and that's correct. And so uh, people can give candidates, citywide candidates, $5,100. That is more money than you can give the President of the United States. And uh, does anyone, has anyone here given anyone $5,100 without asking for anything in return? I once gave something worth about $5,100, perhaps a little bit more than something, but I expected her to spend the rest of her life with it. Yeah. Uh, the good news is she said yes, and we have a great baby at home, uh, so we're going to try to make sure we are done by uh, 8 o'clock tonight, but the point is, on November 6th, on the ballot, you're going to have a chance, the first question on the ballot is, do you want to get big money out of politics? Do you want to have the money from, yes, yeah. do you want to have the money from 5100 down to 2000 do you want to limit council members to 1000 do you want to match small dollars from 6 to 1 to 8 to 1? And do you want to give candidates 75% of the money they need to run instead of having them just get half of it and then get the rest from real estate? Now the truth is, there's always going to be money in politics. The question is, is it going to be your money or real estate money? And that is yours, and I hope you will uh, go to bencalos.com uh, slash charter revision 
and uh, sorry, slash charter slash pledge and take the pledge to vote in favor. I want to start uh, tonight's event by also just, uh, for those of you who just finished celebrating uh, Shana Toba and Gamar Katima Toba. Uh, and uh, we, we hope to have, I, I hope you enjoy eating at some point, whether it's before this event or after this event, but it's a, it's a good thing to get to eat again. Uh, and I want to thank all of you for coming out here. Part of the reason that democracy is broken is that so few people are involved. I represent 168,000 people. I'd say we invited about 60,000, probably 80,000 people here tonight. Uh, and I'm glad that all 80,000 people showed up because you on Facebook don't, you can't see the audience. Now we, we have really good attendance. I really appreciate uh, the 40 to 80 folks who came and RSVP. Uh, we'll be asking you to fill out a survey to tell us how we can do this event better. I see a lot of familiar faces, which means we might be doing well. Uh, and we have reusable bags for folks. Uh, my goal is, regardless of where we are with the city law or the state law, I'm hoping that I can get more and more people to use reusable bags and save the planet. I want to thank Memorial Sun Kettering for hosting us here. Uh, and for uh, we'll be back in January for our State of the District. Uh, this event is co-sponsored by Congressmember Carolyn Maloney, Controller Scott Stringer, Public Advocate Tish James, Senator Liz Kruger will be joining us shortly, Jose Serranos, Manhattan Borough President Gail Brewer, Assemblymember T. Wright, Court Rodriguez, and Councilmember Powers. I'd like to take a moment. Uh, you don't have to wait to the annual town hall to see me face to face. The first Friday of every month from 8 a.m. to 10 a.m., we sit around in a circle and have conversations with each other about anything and everything that you like. You get a chance to meet some of your neighbors. Uh, one of my favorite neighbors is Elspeth Ryman, and uh, she's probably one of the best parts of my job. And if you come to First Friday, you'll get a chance to see what I'm talking about. I also see some other folks who are regulars. We also have a policy night. Uh, has anyone here ever uh, written a law? Do I see any hands for folks who have written a law? Okay, so the, the bad news is that uh, you might be an underachiever because uh, if you're in middle school in my district, uh, Eastside Middle School has actually written a law to uh, bring LGBT training to our uh, schools. And uh, so the, the key thing is we want to work with anyone. We work with the kindergarten on legislation, and we're really happy to work with all of you. So please consider working with my staff on policy night. It's 5 to 6, the second Tuesday of each month. Uh, now, for those of you who this is your first time, uh, it tends to be that a lot of people have very similar questions. So what we tend to do is we try to group them. So did everyone get a, a uh, card on their way in? An index card and a golf pencil. You don't have to play golf, but so everyone has it. When you need a new index card, just raise your empty hand and somebody from my team will come and deliver you an index card. When your index card is empty, and sorry, when it's full, when it has your question on it, and we're asking for questions, not necessarily statements, uh, we'll take it, we'll collect it, and then we'll group them together, and I'll do my best to put all of them together. If you're concerned that you may not get your question answered, because we have a lot of agencies who are going to go pretty quickly tonight, uh, you're welcome to ask questions anonymously, and we'll do our best to group it anonymously. If you want to make sure you get an answer to your question, if you write your name, your email, and your phone number on the back, we promise to get back to you if your question does not get answered. Uh, I want to take a moment to thank uh, my, new, uh, my newest team member. Her name is Abby Damsky. She just graduated from Brandeis, and uh, she put me And so, The other key piece of this is I hope folks have had a chance to see some of the groups tabling outside. Uh, you can feel free to wander in and out as different presentations speak to you or not. Uh, we have uh, Director uh, Daryl Cochran from the New York City Commission on Human Rights, which is charged with the enforcement of human rights law and educating the public and encouraging positive community relations. It's particularly important because I do have a lot of folks who come into my office, uh, particularly folks who, who may be a little older. Uh, whether it's seniors or even people in their 50s who are having trouble getting jobs. And it's the Commission on Human Rights who can really help. Uh, I was talking to them actually earlier this week, and they have 300 different employers that they work with that are interested in hiring older New Yorkers. And our goal is to really make sure that anyone facing discrimination uh, has equity. 
We also have the Friends of the Easter River Esplanade, who are a partner on maintaining our beautiful new Esplanade, which is getting better and better every day. The Friends of the Upper East Side Historic District, uh, who I was actually just working with on taking a new Landmarks and Preservation Commission chair. And Upper Green Side, we work with together on Shredathon. Uh, I believe we have a Shredathon this Saturday at 82nd Street. And uh, it's in our newsletter. And so the point is that we work closely with our partners and we're able to get a lot done and we can get so much more done with your partnership. Tonight we're going to have several city agencies and organizations here to speak to you and take questions about important work they are doing in our district. Uh, we're going to ask them to give presentations between 5 and 10 minutes and then take questions. Our first off, we'll be hearing from the New York City Ferry. Uh, we just launched service at 90th Street. I've already had a chance to take it downtown. It was pretty great. And uh, I've also had a chance to take it from Roosevelt Island, which has been there for over a year. Uh, we have over a million New Yorkers who have written. And uh, before we go to Ferry, we actually have a uh, special guest. You'll give me one moment. Uh, from the New York City Fire Department, uh, we have on. Perfect. So we, we have from the New York City Fire Department, we have Manhattan Borough Commander uh, Roger Sapowicz and Nicole Simmons here. Uh, they're here to give some uh, safety tips and also about how you can get fire alarms installed. I'm asking everyone to pay a lot of attention to share this information. Every year we have fires on the Upper East Side starting now, starting in heating season, and every year we lose lives and that's with the most bravest people in our city literally leaping off the tops of buildings to save people like angels. And they do it every single day, day in, day out. And please join me in welcoming our uh, Manhattan Borough Commander. start my fire department career right here in Manhattan, but I was trying to go to Queens, so I got messed up because I live on Long Island. And when they told me I was assigned to Manhattan, the only time I'd ever been here before, my car was towed away. So I was at the fire uh, prevention. I wasn't sure about that, but they asked me to speak about something else, actually. But I will go into the... the uh, uh, in storing. What we're doing now is we've teamed up with the uh, Kitty Fire Alarms, and uh, not only will we uh, sometimes provide fire alarms, we'll also install a law in uh, our program. So I believe this year we've installed over 100,000 fire alarms the last couple of years in, in dwellings and stuff throughout the city. Uh, we have a fire education uh, unit that deals with that, and I'm um, sure if you go to the fire alarm website, it would give you the information you need to get uh, those installed in your homes, right? Uh, fire safety, like the, the, uh, it's just ongoing. Uh, I can tell you that in Manhattan or throughout the city, what happens at the borough commander, every 12 days we rotate and I'll cover the entire city after 4 o'clock. So I do go to, to each borough. So the other day I was happy to be in, uh, in uh, Brooklyn. Uh, and just recently, you know, all these odd fires that we're having all over the place, it's getting stranger and stranger. So as far as fire prevention, the basics, okay? The candles that we've been preaching for years, uh, food, you know, a cooking stove prevention, that's just the obvious, all right? Uh, was it Monday, we had 137 cars burn in the parking garage in Brooklyn. It turned out it was an arson fire because the man was living in the car, a brand new Mercedes he chose. And of 137 cars, 120 were brand new Mercedes that the Mercedes dealer chose to park there. Now, people ask him, that's odd. Why did they park them in that area? It had to do with Sandy. They used to park them in Brooklyn with lower levels, and those parking lots got flooded. So I figured the second level of a parking lot would be a safe place to put all these brand new cars. As it turned out, it wasn't as safe as they thought. Right? But, just on that note, as far as fires, uh, we have a difficult time with this fire, and a lot of recent fires, 
uh, with high rise in Manhattan and thing is radio communication. So I was going to talk about some of the newer things that we've done to uh, improve our communications in this area. So it does affect the residents in this area because high rise buildings are a unique uh, thing to deal with as far as fire service. The, uh, the radios that we're working with now, uh, the ones we even tested today is called a cutter radio. And what it does is it takes our portable radios, we put it into the building, we put two of them. They're extremely powerful. They pick up our portable radio signal, which we only use two watts, which is very low. We could use more, but the problem is we would interfere with other operations nearby. If we had two powerful radios, we would be stepping on radio communications in other boroughs, of course, the river is clean and, and broken and stuff. So we purposely have to turn them down so we don't walk heads too far. But with high-rise buildings, that, that causes a problem. So now we, because we add these other radios in between that boost our signal just thing. Now we didn't have these, it's a brand new building within the last year. We were able to get some of this new equipment and it really has made a difference. And it has helped a great deal in these, uh, these fires. Right? I thought the councilman would want to speak about all the great improvements that's been done to the local firehouses here in this area. Uh, you will? Sure. Okay. So, uh, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the, I guess you call discretionary budget numbers that we were able to uh, give some additional funding to the fire department in the last several years, uh, last two years particularly, uh, funded some renovations that were desperately needed in some of these very old firehouses in the area, and also to bring them up to new standards because now we have quite a few female firefighters. And firehouses weren't prepared for that because you would walk up in fire house and it'd be a you know, bunk room, you'd walk through it to get to the office and you'd walk through the, uh, uh, by the way, we don't sleep in the fire house, we just rest. We <laughs> take the children, help them bring them to do the tours, that's going for resting. Okay? So, and as I said, I started right here at 4400 on 75th Street, I was there for nine years. And that's how that fire house was, you come up the stairs and you were in the resting area, bunk room, and you walk through. So we gave the tours to the children. We had a firefighter went out and bought, you know, the covers, the, the, the bed spreads. He had, we had 12 beds. So six of them were Donald Ducks and six of them were Mickey Mouse. The kids loved it when they saw that the firefighter slept in those beds because they could relate to that. But anyway, so this caused a problem because the, the bathrooms obviously were all male. The washroom dryers were in the bathroom, so the female firefighters had to go into the male bathroom to wash the sheets and uh, do their own laundry and stuff. So it became a big problem. So the, the fire department, along with the city and the funding of the discretionary budget that the uh, council they were, uh, help us with, we had to renovate quite a few firehouses. And, and right here in this area, most of the fires have been run on uh, 85th Street, 22 engine was renovated for, for that female firefighter. 44 engine, when I got the 44 engine in uh, 1984, there was a female firefighter in that firehouse already before I got there. She was one of the first, okay? She didn't have any special accommodations, I can tell you that, all right? But uh, it worked then, it's gotten a little bit more technical now with everything going on, so uh, these renovations have helped a great deal. Uh, kept down the what we call the EEO complaints and any other problems, so that, that's been good. Just recently, I believe the uh, council member, um, Carlos, also uh, got $525,000 to do an additional renovation to the firehouse on 85th Street. Going to get new windows, which were desperately needed. It was built under an older budget, and the windows definitely they don't work, but they also leak stuff. So we're going to get new windows and new front doors. So that, that's a big help, and I know he was involved with getting that. Thank you very much. We appreciate that. I can tell you also, as far as fire responses in this area, the uh, when I worked up here, we did about 2,500 runs a year, 44 runs a year, which is about seven runs every 24-hour period, right? They're doing over 6,000 runs today, right? Most of the companies in this area are doing that. Uh, some of them have to do with us helping other agencies. Uh, years ago, when you uh, called Con Edison for a gas leak, you got Con Edison. Now you get a fire truck because after the buildings that blew up, they figured maybe we should get there a little faster. So now that added about 180,000 runs in one year to the fire department. Uh, we picked up by us and Connors and responding. If you call the fire department, you got the fire department. But if you call Connors and the National Group for a gas leak, 
they would come, they needed us, they would call us. Now we respond to this, so they're required to know about us. Water leaks, elevator emergency is very common in this area. Uh, a little south of here, there's a, a building called Trump Tower. <laughs> and, and I'll end with this. I'm going to be careful here because I think I know my audience. I'm supposed to. Yeah. Right, right, Senator? Yeah. And the food is here and she's dying. So I'm going to take a shot on this one. I might be going out on a limb, all right? <laughs> but we had a fire in that building a little while ago. And the fire was on the 50th floor. The president was not in the building, but it's a unique situation that the President of the United States actually lives on the 66th floor of a high-rise building in Manhattan. The uh, fire department was required to be within six floors of the President of the United States when every stage in, in Manhattan, which he will be here next week for the UN General Assembly. It makes it very difficult because the people within six floors didn't like us sharing their apartments with us, so it made it a little difficult. So we weren't really allowed to do it in this building. We had to come up with another idea. Which you did, but the, the day of the fire, he wasn't home, but his his uh, apartment is protected by the Secret Service, obviously. So there were two Secret Service people on duty, one in the lobby, one in the apartment. The fire started, the one in the apartment tried to come down the stairs, which we told him is not a good idea when the smoke from the 50th floor was coming up the stairs. So his partner lost contact with him, so the partner notified the chief, I can't contact my uh, associate on the 66th floor. So we dispatched rescue one members to get up to, to look for him. And when they got up there, they still couldn't find him. So I, I'm over here to the you may or may not like Do you know what the doors to the President of the United States apartment look like on the 66th floor? Well, they're big. They could be polished brass, but they could be gold. We're not sure. But our halogens, after they broke the door down, I can tell you that the Secret Service heard it. Yeah, I didn't know my audience. I got pictures. So we got a call from the Secret Service because we did a big problem. And it wasn't that big. The problem was that the Secret Service agent had made it a little bit down the stairs. All members had found him. He was almost unconscious, and they took him to the roof, and they were reviving him up there. On the other end, it, it would have been better for him if he had been in there and he was dead because I think he's in Arizona or something now because we did an unescorted search of the President of the United States apartment and there were no cameras in there so we had firefighters going through search for this member there. They weren't happy. But I don't know if you're going to go back. Any questions about the other world? So, uh, that we don't have questions for the uh, fire department. So uh, the next person we will welcome up is our state senator, Liz Kruger. Let me give a quick introduction, then you can give the applause. So I've had the privilege of working with Liz before I got elected. Uh, she is uh, she is amazing. She always stands up for what's right, no matter what the political consequences are. And uh, I, I will say, in a business that does not always reward courage. It is so much easier to stand up for what's right when as soon as you do it or you're about to do it, you've got Liz Kruger standing next to you, and then you, if you have Liz, you usually have Gail Brewer, and together as three musketeers, we've been up to no good for, they, they've been up to no good long before me, but uh, <laughs> over the past four and a half years, it's been my pleasure to join them. Please join me in welcoming Senator Liz Kruger. Trust me. The people who live there don't want to come there next week. 
morning. Um, but any other time, come visit, contact us, email us. And yes, I continue to try to do the best I can on behalf of my district and the people of New York in Albany. Um, of course, you have to go out and vote in November. Um, it's election time. I'm not asking who you're voting for. I'm just urging everyone to vote. And I think if elections go the way I hope they do in November, it's going to be a very interesting year in Albany come January when I go back to the Senate uh, with more friends and colleagues joining me to fight the good fights. So, Ben, thank you for inviting me to say a few words. My pleasure. And everybody enjoy the town hall. Thank you. After I was elected, uh, there was a, another vacancy on the Upper East Side, and say Senator Kruger and I sat down and spoke about the fact that there are fewer women representing us in Albany than there are women in New York City and State. In fact, women outnumber men in the city of New York and State, uh, which I think is a good thing for men. Uh, but that being said, we worked together and we were able to elect uh, one of the best assembly members in the city of New York. She's been able to get legislation passed uh, in her freshman year. She has an office right on 79th Street and she's incredibly accessible. If you can join me in welcoming our assembly member, Rebecca C. Wright. Thank you, Councilman Kalos. I am uh, so honored to have you represent me in the City Council. His office is doing a fabulous job, and uh, we're so lucky to have you represent us. We get uh, been in your building, cooking with Kalos, participating, uh, budgeting, funding for our Eastside Esplanade, and so much more from your office, Ben. So thank you again. Uh, it's my pleasure to represent you in the New York State Assembly. Uh, working alongside my partner, State Senator Liz Kruger, and in the Congress, Carolyn Maloney, along with uh, another council member that represents part of the Upper East Side, Keith Powers, and Senator Jose Serrano, who represents the Roosevelt Island part of the 76th Assembly District. We had a very productive legislative session in Albany this year, um, and for our district, I was able to bring back over a million dollars to award to libraries, uh, public schools, and uh, nonprofit organizations. Uh, my Equal Rights Amendment bill that I sponsored passed the assembly, and uh, it was not, unfortunately, brought up for a vote in the state senate. So I'm going to be a little bit more blunt than our senator was a minute ago. She said she was not going to tell you to vote for and neither am I. But I am going to tell you that the Equal Rights Amendment bill should be passed in the Senate, and as long as it's in the leadership hands that it's in now, it will never come up for a vote. So um, you can take that uh, for what it's worth, and we're going to keep pushing it because I believe very strongly that the New York State Constitution should have the Equal Rights Amendment in it. It passed unanimously in the Senate, and uh, I believe that it should pass in the Senate. Um, something that my office has been watching very closely is the development and the construction on the Upper East Side. Last week we hosted a meeting with Excel Builders in the office with the president of the Neighborhood Association on 79th Street and we asked a lot of questions about the block on 1st Avenue between 79th and 80th. If you pass it, there's an odor. We don't know what that smell is coming from, if it's hazardous. And uh, we've asked them to post a public notice, which they should have already done, on the front of the building where they've done the demolition. We also hosted a meeting with Target uh, Corporation, incorporated in the district office. Target, as you know, is putting a store on the Upper East Side. We have a lot of questions and community concerns. So um, I want to invite all of you to stop by the office, 1485 York Avenue at 79th Street, right next to the post office. At your community office, if you want to have a meeting in the conference room, feel free to call us and schedule a meeting. We'd love to see you and have you come by. Thank you all, and thanks again, Councilman Kalos. Back to our regularly scheduled program. We're so grateful to have our state elected officials stopping by. 
We're going to hear from the New York City Ferry, followed by the Department of Education, followed by the Department of Homeless Services, followed by the Parks Department, uh, and, uh, sorry, uh, between, sorry, Ferry, Education, Homeless, MTA, and Parks and Recreation. Uh, so, as I had initially started, uh, we have new ferry service. It's just started on 90th Street. It's pretty great. Uh, we also have it now on Roosevelt Island. And if you can please join me in welcoming Robbie Miranda. Uh, he'll be giving a digital presentation on the new East 90, 90th Street ferry stop here on the Upper East Side. And uh, we actually I got to join our state assembly member for our, our Dawn Ride from uh, Soundview in the Bronx. Uh, which was several hours before other folks woke up to join the event, <laughs> and uh, it was a lot of fun. And uh, we were also joined by many members of Community Board 8 who are represented here today by their district manager, Will Brightville. Thank you for putting in such long hours. Uh, so please join me in welcoming up Robbie. Time for commuters are going to doing just that. <laughs> so that's it. So here 
We have um, just an overview of the Soundview route. Uh, as the council member said, it starts over at Soundview in the Bronx, um, comes down to East 90th Street, continues down to 34th Street, and then Wall Street. And here's an overview of where um, the access points are. As of right now, we have a temporary path uh, to the landing, um, which is off of between 89th Street and 90th Street. And the next slide shows it. Sorry. You go to the next slide. It yes, shows and, it. Yes, and I'll, and I'll, I'll go to the next slide, which actually highlights it a little um, easier. So that's the temporary path. It does include some stairs right now, which I know your assembly member and the councilman has both raised to, to EDC to make sure that we have accessible ADA points. We are working with the Parks Department, who's done a lot of work on the southern end um, of the park, and they're hopeful to open up that entrance by early 2019. And then on the northern end, um, from 96th Street, we're working with um, the uh, Department of Sanitation and Department of Design and Construction to actually open that up um, later this year. So we're hopeful um, to, to really get that, get those access points opened up sooner rather than later. And some information about the landing itself. So the landing, um, as most of you have seen, um, looks pretty similar to this. Um, it includes some wood screens. Um, that's where we do the, the queuing, and you get your ticketing machines there. Um, some wind screens, of course. And then we have, um, we designed it this way so that it does minimal destruction, uh, minimal impact to the upland area. So we didn't want to interfere a lot with the park, so that's why we have a floating bar here that is separate from the, from the upland. And um, this is typically what um, the gangway looks like over there. It's pretty wide, um, again, to a lot for ADA accessibility. Um, and um, we, get, we have a lot of signage, particularly in this area, as there's a lot of destruction in the area. We've been, um, made a concerted effort to really put a lot of signage on. Um, this is what it looks like inside of the landing. Um, again, your ticketing machine and also a digital display that tells you when the next vessel is coming and where it's going to. And if there are any delays, we also push that information there as well as um, in other ways that a lot of things going to talk about later. And Alana. Hi everybody, my name is Alana. I work for Hornblower, which is the company that operates in Missy Ferry. Um, so if you've been at all near the waterfront in the last year and a half, you've seen our boats up and down the harbor. Um, they're new construction, they're low weight design, um, that's to minimize any disruption to upland um, and other vessels in the water. Um, we have EPA Tier 3 engines, which are the best for this vessel class size, and they're catamaran for comfort and stability. Um, these boats hold 150 passengers. We do have a couple new 350 passenger boats that are now in the harbor operating, um, which have some great names, uh, Ocean Queen Rockstar and Seize the Day are the two larger boats that you'll see. Um, that, that is dependent on when we see a uh, large ridership in the area and when we would implement them. And you can bring your bicycle, you'll bring your wheelchair, your stroller on board. Um, we have areas for parking your bikes, hanging them, or strollers um, in the front of the boats as well. These are, uh, it's a little visual of our concessions area, so if you are on board, you can grab a snack, um, enjoy the ride. This is from our partner, the new Sam. And some of the uh, features that we have for ticketing, um, the app is a great way to get your tickets. Um, you can look at your schedules and trip planning there. Um, service alerts, we now have uh, real-time updates. And we have real-time ferry tracking. Um, and updates to the app just came out yesterday. Um, so it's even faster than it was before. Uh, hopefully no more of the little loading circle spinning wheel. Um, and you can purchase tickets this way on the app, and then you just activate them, show the deck hand. Um, it's a great way to transfer if you need to do that. You just activate the ticket. It stays active for 90 minutes, which allows you for the free transfer within the ferry system. Um, if you don't want to use the app, which is fine, you can also get a ticket app landing from the ticket vending machines with your card, cash. We also take commuter debit cards. Um, and if you need to transfer with a paper ticket, you would just, when you get on your first boat, ask the concession agent um, at the on board for a transfer. And this is what some of the um, app schedule and tracking look like. Uh, it kind of lets you know if your boat's on time. If you click on one of those little bubbles, uh, that shows you where the boat's going, where it came from, and if it's at all behind schedule. 
and I'm on the community engagement team for MIC Ferry, so uh, we do a lot of different initiatives. Um, as I mentioned, our boats are named by uh, second graders, second classes, so that's why we have fun names like Lunchbox and Mission Queen Rockstar. Um, we have hiring initiatives with Workforce One centers uh, throughout the city. We do a community connect blog series where we highlight local businesses or community leaders, um, and we have an all hands on deck employee volunteer program. Um, we are actually working on one for a couple weeks from now, but if you're interested in, in having us come out and bring a couple of our crew members to volunteer with the organization, please let me know. Um, and we do tabling at different neighborhood events. Um, we will be at the B2Ys uh, Big Street Festival in a couple weeks, so looking forward to that. Um, yeah, and if you have any questions, feel free to let us know. Uh, if you have questions, fill out the cards. We have one, two questions so far, so if you have your card, fill it out. We'll collect it. Yeah. And just one brief uh, announcement just before we go into the, the question segment. So brief. Um, earlier this week, we launched, we launched uh, an announcement that uh, we released quarterly reports um, on ridership. So if you are interested in how um, the Astoria route is doing or how ridership going to Roosevelt Island is doing, um, you can certainly take a look through that. Um, we will include Soundview Route for the future uh, reports. And we also are launching a feasibility study to understand where else in the city New Yorkers want us to study for to be included as part of um, potentially the ferry system. So we want to, um, we also um, launched that in that announcement. So if you're interested in, you know, as a pre survey, just where, who you are and where, where you think we should be included in, in the study, we welcome that. And then we'll be working, working with our elected officials on the waterfront and community board leadership to also um, get their input on this. So that's all, and then I think Franny's gonna start with some of the questions that have been written down already. Thank you. Hi everyone, I'm Franny, I'm with the New York City Economic Development Corporation. Um, so we've got three questions here. The first one is, are you working on being able to use your Metro card for, for the ferry uh, and being able to get transfers? So as many of you likely know, um, MTA is phasing out their, their legacy Metro card. Um, so that will be completely phased out by 2023, they are anticipating. Um, so we are, um, when they have established their new form of transit, we will continue our conversations with them to see how that might be possible. For right now, however, um, our fare is set at the same price as the MetroCard, but it is not um, able to transfer. Um, the second question was, the city's environmental impact study showed that the new ferries will raise nitrogen dioxide to dangerous levels and that there are no plans to address this. Why is the city not taking steps to address this health problem? Um, so I would love to speak to the person who wrote this question. Awesome, because this is the first that any of us are hearing about this, so we would have to look into this more to get you more information. But I will reiterate what Alana said. Um, our ferries, while they do use diesel, um, are have the best engine in their class, which helps reduce emissions, and they're very light, um, so there is less fuel to be used. So I'll connect with you later and, and get more information from you. Um, uh, can we use a senior metro card? So you can't use any metro cards at all, but uh, NYC Ferry does offer discount uh, passes for senior citizens and people with disabilities. Those are valid for the 30-day passes only. Um, there is an application. You can go to ferry.nyc right here, and there is um, uh, an application for that. You fill that out. Um, you either mail it in or drop it off at Pier 11. There's a review process, and then you're eligible to either have a discounted 30-day pass on your app, or you can pick up a physical 30-day pass from uh, Pier 11 ticket office, and that's good for half off. Um, so if anyone is, is thinks there might be a frequent ferry rider and that applies to you, that might be a good um, more questions. Yes. Uh, so we have two more questions here. Sorry, thank you. Uh, which is, um, can we get an East 60th stop um, or somewhere in the East 60s? Um, as I mentioned, this is the opportunity to hear that input. Um, if you can log on and go to um, the New York City Economic Development website um, on our press releases from Tuesday, uh, we have a, a, a survey where you can where you can put that information. And also, our elected officials are also here. They will be at the table um, in the coming weeks, and we'll have the conversations as well. So, but we'll write this one down. Um, and then the next question is, is these 
96th Street uh, really safe. Once the Esplanade has been repaired, how will you handle the slope behind Gracie Mansion? Uh, and again, uh, that's you know some of the work that uh, we spoke about to access the, the ferry. Uh, the east, the southern entrance um, is certainly going to be opening in the in early 20, um, 2019. I was like, what year are we in? Sorry. <laughs> um, and then um, I, I'd love to connect with whoever um, wrote this as well because yes, we are working to make that also ADA accessible um, from the southern from the northern entrance. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. All right. Thank you. So we are running a little bit behind, and I want to thank all of the agencies that are here waiting patiently. I want to uh, thank Assemblymember Rebecca Seawright. She's been leading the citywide effort of elected officials at every level for getting a transfer between the MTA and the ferry. And I've been working closely with our Assemblymember and our Congress member in particular because we really do want that East 60th Street stop. We feel that connecting Soundview to the 60th Street would really open up a world of economic opportunity for the rest of the city. Uh, so next up, we have uh, prepay. This is something where, uh, when I was running, I was interested in making it happen, but I wasn't the candidate for mayor. This was something that Mayor de Blasio ran on and won. He uh, went to Albany. I uh, joined him in the advocacy, and uh, we, we were able to secure the funding. I was disappointed that in 2014, when we won, we got 147 seats. Four and a half years later, uh, we, are, we just opened two pre-K centers with over just about 250 seats, uh, which brings us on track to opening 900 seats by 2019. Uh, so that is 750 new seats, and that is quite a lot. And uh, the Department of Education has put together a great team that includes the Senior Director for Pre-K and 3K Admissions, uh, Julia Kay, and their Outreach Director for Pre-K uh, for All, who I have known in other capacities, and he's been working for our city in many different ways, John Tripp. And so I, I will say, I, I, when I first got elected, I was a newlywed, and uh, that was actually got married right afterwards, and I had a feeling that one day, I was going to have pre-K was going to be very meaningful to me, and now I, I have even more self-interest now that I have a seven-month-old daughter who I would like to send to 3K in our district, which means we need another 1,800 seats at least. That being <laughs> said, on. when we looked at the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene's report for this community district eight where we're standing, there were 2,500 children who were born. Uh, four years ago and will eligible, be eligible for pre-K in 2019. So I'm hoping that the 900 seats are enough, but I am, it is likely that we'll need another 1,900 seats on top of the other 1,800 seats that we'll need for 3K. So that being said, uh, we're gonna hope that uh, DOE can uh, give us their presentation in the time that they have. I think we're just in verbal here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Perfect. Come on up. Good evening. As the council member said, my name is John Trick. I'm the executive director of outreach in the Division of Early Childhood Education at the Department of Education. And we are very happy to have our uh, long-standing partnership with the council member in making pre-K for all a reality um, here in the Upper East Side. Um, just want to you know, give a, a few notes about where things stand citywide in pre-K, and we'll be happy to answer any questions that you might have. So this past September 7th was the fifth year of universal pre-K for all in New York City. So it's the fifth, the fifth year. It's kind of amazing how fast time has gone, um, but you know, Prior to 2014, there's only about 18,000 pre-K seats across New York City. In the first year of the expansion, that number jumped up to 50,000, and every year since then, we've served close to 70,000 uh, four-year-olds across New York City. So as the council member mentioned, we are now expanding the program to, to have a universal three-year-olds program that will be rolled, that's serving um, several districts this year, but we'll be rolling out um, two districts a year and then ultimately, our aim is to be universal for the 20 uh, in 2021. So, um, 
A fun fact I'd like to share about pre-K is that as we serve close to 70,000 students, that's about 15,000 more students than Boston's entire public school system K through 12. So we serve that many four-year-olds alone here in New York City, just to give you a, a scope of, of how big it really is. Um, there's only two criteria to be eligible for a pre-K seat in New York. You have Your child has to be born in the applicable year. So for this year, children have to be born in 2014. And you have to reside in the five boroughs. So if you reside anywhere in the five boroughs and your child was born in the year 2014, they're guaranteed to have, uh, a, a, there will be a pre-K seat for them. Um, we worked very hard in this community to, to have as many seats available as possible. And as the council member has mentioned, we made some great strides into to meeting the demand in the community. Um, and yeah, so um, we're happy to answer any questions you might have about, about pre-K or the upcoming 3K uh, program. Um, but so far, you know, this, this, is, this has worked because of the partnership and the, the participation of families across the city. Um, I think lastly, something to note about it that makes it a unique model that is different from a lot of um, pre-K programs across the country, and that's 60% of the universal pre-K seats are in community-based organizations. We call them NYSEECs, or New York City Early Childhood Education Centers, um, but they are actually, 60% uh, um, of those seats are in private programs that get their funding through the Department of Education, and around the other 40% are in district school settings. So there's a diverse array of options for families to choose from, and programs can be as small as one 18-child section, or as large as the Bishop Ford site in Brooklyn that served about 450 four-year-olds, called the world's cutest place. But um, So that's Pre-K for All, and uh, we're easy to get in contact with. If we need an outreach team that's citywide, uh, happy to see Leilani here tonight, who is representing uh, DHS, who was a member of that team. But we'll go and we'll meet with small groups of families, we'll meet with large groups of families, we'll go anywhere families are to try to explain options to them, explain the application process, explain how to enroll. Um, and so I'm going to leave contact information out front. So, you know, we are happy to meet with families and talk to them over the phone and to help them with the process. Um, the school year has started, but to the extent that there's seats still available in the city, um, there's still time for families to enroll if they haven't done so already for this school year. Um, so we encourage families to reach out if that's the case, and we'll do what we can to find an open seat for them. Um, but aside from that, we're geared up for next year already. And so the application process will open in late January or early February, or sometime early in the next year. Um, and when we get all those dates nailed down, we will make sure everyone's aware of them. Um, and that's already, so we're already planning for the, for the sixth year of pre-K for all. Thank you. Yep. I don't think we have any questions on pre-K. Uh, looks like we just got a card sent over. Did somebody pull that gentleman's card? Uh, sure. Uh, we'll get to that in a bit, but I just want to thank this uh, DOE team. Every year we do our best, and if you know anyone, please encourage them to apply, even if they're considering a private option. We want everyone, every four-year-old, if we are succeeding, we've gotten all 2,500 four-year-olds to apply because we want them to be in a situation where they can choose where they want to go. And one of the situations we run into, we still have a lot of folks who are choosing between a private provider and a public provider. And uh, we would like everyone to start with pre-K and save about $30,000 as the short run. And there's providers in my district that are $60,000 and more. And uh, my hope is that folks who can afford to pay $60,000 a year will go to pre-K and stay in the public school system so that we have economically integrated schools in our district. Mm -hmm. So thank you very much. Thanks, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We have a homeless crisis in our city. Uh, did anyone here take public transportation to get here today? And of those folks, did anyone go past somebody who may have been on the street, may have been sleeping on the street, or may have been panhandling for money? Did anyone see some of those folks? And so when folks say, well, I think one of the things I've heard is, well, why can't they get a job? And 
the quick answer is because 23,000 of our city's 60,000 homeless are children. And so we have labor loss. And so this morning about 23,000 children woke up in a homeless shelter and went to a city public school, and that includes pre-Ks. And 17,000 of those people in our shelters are the parents of those children. So about two-thirds of our homeless in our shelters are families and their children. Uh, there's about 6,000 or 7,000 single men. There's about 3,000 single women. And those are people who are in shelters. They don't have homes. They are sheltered. And as of the last survey, I believe we had about 3,700 folks who are unsheltered. Uh, that was in the mayor's management report. And those are the folks who are on our streets. And they're not generally the folks who are panhandling. Panhandling is a First Amendment protected profession. Uh, the person who is panhandling on your block very likely makes more a day than you do. And uh, if you are giving them money, you may be just paying them to be there and it's a transaction. You feel good giving them money, they feel good taking your money. Uh, but the folks we're talking about who are unsheltered is if you happen to be out at late at night, at midnight, and between midnight and 6 a.m., perhaps you're a young person or a young person at heart, and uh, you're headed home. The folks who are sleeping, those are the unsheltered. And uh, in February, sorry, in January, there will be a hope count where you can get a first-hand account working with DHS. Now, we have an Eastside Task Force for Homeless Outreach and Services. We work with a lot of providers in the neighborhood, uh, and this is from folks like Church of the Epiphany, which has a, a soup kitchen uh, just a couple of blocks away from here, to the Park Avenue Am Armory, right on Park Avenue. It's the, it's the shelter in the city which I think has the best address. Uh, and we work with the food pantry and work with everyone. And what I will tell you is that the face of hunger is changing, and it is everyone from people who are unsheltered to a senior who just may not know where their next meal is coming from is going to show up at that soup kitchen uh, or that food pantry or a family that's just trying to make ends meet and pay their rent. And so we have Lani Urban and Lori Boozer from DHS who are here to just uh, make a quick 10 minute presentation and any questions you have on homelessness. Please raise your hand with the cards if you have any questions, and if you can please join me in welcoming them. Hello. Good evening, all. Hi. Hi. My name is Leilani Urban, and I'm the Manhattan Borough Director for DHS. Um, and this is Lori Hooser. I'm not going to take you guys' time, um, but just to echo, first of all, I want to thank Councilmember Ben Cables for holding um, this town hall and inviting DHS. Um, as he expressed, yes, the face of homelessness primarily is families with children. I think when, individual, when many people think about the crisis that we face in the city, I don't think that is the picture of who is the majority of who is in, in our homeless shelter system. Um, so I just want to put emphasis on this mayor's uh, turning the tide initiative that he's rolling out. Um, our job and responsibility is to educate constituents and everyday New Yorkers about the many services that DHS and HRA provides. Um, one of our main primary goals and concern is making sure New Yorkers are aware about what homeless prevention options they have. Um, DHS is done a great job, I think, in terms of expanding services into our home-based program. And we've expanded that organization across the city, uh, that nonprofit uh, organization across the city of uh, New York. And that is where individuals can get access to counsel if in the event they're facing eviction, may not have the financial means to um, get a lawyer, they now have the right to get access to counsel as well as possibly go through an assessment where they can see if they need something called like a one-shot deal, which would help keep them in their home if need be, as well as several different other services that Home Base provides. But the primary goal is to prevent individuals from entering our shelter system. Um, as it relates to the council members' district, and you all, if I show of hands, how many lives in the district? Okay. Great, thank you. So, as it relates to your district and as it relates to homelessness, 
one of the reoccurring things that we oftentimes get flagged on are street related issues from um, street homeless individuals bedding down on the street or building what's called an encampment, meaning that there's a structure, whether it be a cardboard box that they have, like built like a physical structure um, where they're bedding down and sleeping under. That's called an encampment. DHS has an outreach team, and we've expanded the number of outreach teams that we have across the city. Um, they would go out, they do engagements, live engagements on the street. Many of them are certified social worker clinicians. We also have um, some nurse practitioners who also can go out to observe individuals. Sometimes they may need to check their feet um, to see if they need to be, um, sometimes they may be in imminent danger to themselves and may need to, you know, be, we're not an enforcement agency, but our street outreach team, when engaging an individual who does appear to be in danger to themselves, we can um, escort these individuals into um, medical treatment. Um, but our outreach team canvases in your district quite frequently, quite often, at least four times a day. Um, and I just want to share a couple stats as it relates to your district. Um, so in this area, our outreach team has engaged in total 21 homeless individuals, and of that percentage, five have gone into transitional housing, one in permanent housing, and two have been diverted into church beds. Um, we're aware of all of the hot spots in the district, in your area, all of the hot spots that are flagged to us, we listen and hear and the council members uh, ethos committee uh, that he holds. And uh, thank you for having that uh, committee because it's, very, it's really crucial and it's essential to the work that we do in terms of being the ears on the ground and listening to, uh, to the roundtable discussions about what issues are pressing in the district. Um, and as a result from that meeting, you're able to identify all of the pressing street homeless flags and street homeless individuals uh, in the district. Uh, with that said, I don't want to take too much time, but um, we're doing our very best. It's a challenge. It's very challenging. But our street outreach teams are out there engaging every day. It takes trust when dealing with the street homeless population. It takes approximately 253 engagements, they say, before an individual decides to accept services. Once again, we're not an enforcement agency. Homelessness is not a crime. We do not treat it as such, but we do try to take this administration, I think, has done a wonderful job of trying to take a holistic approach in addressing and assisting individuals, especially as it pertains to the district of street homeless uh, concerns. It takes a lot of engagements for, the, for our street outreach team and to build a relationship and a trust relationship and, 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 and um, that, so that takes a while, that takes a number of engagements. However, we are making placements, we are making some small success in some areas, but we can, you know, we're, we're out there, we're engaging every day, we're trying. Um, if in the event you identify an individual who appears to be street homeless, you can always do one or two things. Reach out to Council Member Cable's office, who would then flag that case to me. Or you can contact 311. Within an hour, our street outreach teams will be dispatched and engage the individual um, that you flagged for 311. 311 will then in turn give you an update readout report on the status of the engagement made. As well as when you flag to the council member, I will provide a report or a readout on the engagement and attempts made. It's up to the individual if they'd like to accept services. Um, so once again, if in the event you do reach out to the council member or 311 and you still see the individual, it doesn't mean that we didn't engage them. It just means that it still takes a little bit of time for us to build that trust and relationship and takes a while for the individual to feel comfortable to accept services. Um, at this time, I'll just open it up to Q&A or Lori. Just loser. So we have two questions that we just the first one I'll address is rumors a men's shelter is to be built on 61st, 21st, and 2nd to compensate for 432 Park 
being allowed to go higher. Just out of curiosity, what would you say the person who asked this question, being allowed to go higher in what way are we talking about? Increase the height of the building. 432 Park is that splinter building. It's like eight million stories high on Park Avenue with the at 15th Street, I believe, 54th Street. Anyway, the rumor is that a homeless shelter is going to be built on 61st Street between 1st and 2nd. Are you talking about, you're not talking about the armory, are you talking about no. the park so right next, next to the bridge? So, uh, adjacent to the Queensboro exit, there was a piece of property that lay vacant for about as long as I can remember, so probably 20 or 30 years, that was owned by the Archdiocese. The Archdiocese sold it to a private developer. The private developer sat down and asked what I would let them get away with, and I said, nothing. And so they're putting up two towers with a, uh, a space in between them that's going to be, I think, six or ten feet, it's not very tall, and it's going to be a medical office space. But, so it's, I guess, it's just seven stories. Right, just seven stories. But I, it says community use? It's community use, but they're not looking to do something as beneficial as supportive housing, which we need desperately. They're looking to do medical space. I asked them to give us pre-K seats, and they didn't. Uh, I offered them additional height for it, they wouldn't. Uh, so this was just a developer where they thought they could get away with more, I wouldn't let them. I asked them to do, I, I, I would have taken supportive housing if we could buy. Our goal with Ethos, with Senator Kruger, with Gail Brewer, uh, is to build supportive housing as wherever we can, because we got a choice. The, a person can be on our street, or they can be in a shelter, or they can be in supportive housing as our neighbor, and that's my my preference for that. So uh, there's more questions. There's two more questions. The second question is, since many homeless are mentally ill, what is being done to provide mental health support services that will help them? So I think one of the things that we want to make sure we highlight under the Bayer's plan, which is a borough-based plan, is that as we bring on additional mental health capacity in our system, we're able to specialize services at those sites which are mental health oriented, and we can then work across our system to bring individuals who may have a need for specific mental health assistance into a facility that is geared towards offering that type of assistance. And then as Ivani stated, our individuals who go out to Canvas the homeless individuals are also licensed and trained to be able to address and deal with any sort of mental health issues that we're encountering on the street. As we sort of go through what's called the model budgeting process across our system, we're working with our providers to make sure that we're bringing the services across the system up to par so that there's not one provider that is able to sort of offer a greater level of service than another provider. Um, I think that obviously the goal under the new plan is to continue to increase capacity so that we're properly sheltering individuals according to the needs that are entering our system. And then the last question we got is, tonight there are approximately 40 faith-based homeless shelters run by volunteers in our city for both single men and single women, but 50% of those beds are empty. Can DHS work more closely with dropping centers to ease access for homeless people to be safe and welcoming beds? And can DHS build SROs? Sure. And that's a great question. Um, as it relates to the rest of beds, it's challenging in dealing with. So, what we face with the street homeless population oftentimes. We will encounter individuals who may be suffering from mental health, excuse me, who may be suffering from mental health issues. They may have addiction to some form of substance, uh, whether it be alcohol, <coughs> drugs, etc. Um, they may not always, coming off the street, have physical identification. These are some of the requirements 
um, that are needed in order to enter the respite beds at, the, at these church beds. So the threshold in terms of their requirements of, as to who can enter um, is challenging. Um, for just for example, uh, location, hours, dates. So most of the respite beds, church beds, operate on Tuesdays and Thursdays or Mondays and Fridays. And if an individual, I think DHS takes an approach in terms of like what is best for the client. And so when we are engaging and doing an assessment with our street homeless population, when we're making placements, we would like for them to be placed in an, in a, in an area or a site where they can get long-term services and benefits. If in the event that our population that we're servicing um, cannot necessarily meet the rest of the bed requirement, we would not make a placement there. They're sex offenders, they cannot be placed at the rest of the bed. Um, if they, like I stated before, or have any substance abuse uh, issues, they cannot be placed in the rest of the bed. Mental health issues cannot be placed in the rest of the bed. If they don't have a TV screening, they cannot be placed in the rest of the bed. Oftentimes, street homeless population that we engage in when we make placements, they don't necessarily have that appropriate medical documentation on them or with them. And so it's just challenging. We acknowledge that um, we appreciate having the, the rest of the beds and the church beds, but I think that the requirements are so hot. This, this, the standard in terms of who can enter um, are very high, and it's challenging given the population that we work with, realistically speaking, um, as to who we see um, as to whom is street homeless. And, and we want to ensure what is best for the client is long-term um, solutions, long-term services at sites. So those are the type of placements we make. And I know we're running out of time, but I do want to touch on the importance of drop-in centers. Um, we find that our street homeless population function better in a drop-in or safe haven sites where there are less uh, rules and regulations placed on them from curfew to um, the fact that they can come in if they are um, not in the best mental state. If they can, this slide is attracted to me, <laughs> that they can, um, they can enter our safe havens even if they may be using um, there's limited restrictions, and so they thrive in that, in that type of environment. So we find our safe havens to be very successful in terms of making placement uh, with the street homeless population. But we do try our best to still try to make placements into church beds, but it's challenging given the restrictions, if that makes sense. So just quickly, the last part was can the adjustable SROs? The quick answer is no. We don't actually build sort of any form of housing. Um, we are entering a place where we have a number, well not a number, but a handful of sites that have come online under the term of time plan where there is a component of affordable housing in the shelter facility. So if it's like an 80-20 property, depending on financing, a portion of the, the property might be shelter and another set aside number of apartments would be affordable apartments that our clients can so I want to thank folks for their expertise. Whoever wrote the question about the number of vacant beds, we're interested in working with you. Please make sure to see Abby so we can try to drill down with DHS and see if we can get all those beds filled. Uh, as mentioned, this is really all about relationships. Uh, the reason it's so hard to get somebody to accept help is because we all were taught as children that if somebody shows up and offers assistance and says, just come with me, the answer is no. And so when you see somebody, you press the app, it's really quick, or you can call 311. More often than not, they're going to refuse services, but if you keep on doing it, eventually they'll build a relationship. I've heard people complain that the 19th Precinct officers, they see them, they see them kidding around with the folks, and they're saying, why are these people kidding around and smiling and laughing and having a good time? The answer is because they're building a relationship. So we're hoping that if you have a relationship with anyone who's on the street, whether they're panhandling or uh, bedded down or what have you, that we can work together to get them the help they need. And ultimately, 
if anyone here works in real estate and actually wants to work with us to build supportive housing or knows of a vacant lot on their block, we're happy to work with you and DHS. We've so far opened up housing for 18, 17 families uh, who have been formerly homeless that we're hoping to get built. It's actually in construction as we speak. We also just opened up uh, additional supportive housing in my district on 100th Street and I will literally work with you to build supportive housing wherever we can. So thank you very much to DHS. <laughs> the most popular speaker every year <laughs> is the MTA, uh, and we have uh, from there, just hold the plus for a moment, is, is Marcus' book. Mm -hmm. So the first question is, who here took a bus today? Because I took a bus to get here. And so if we could just take a look in the audience, I'd say about a quarter to a, a, about a third to a half of the audience uh, took the bus. How many people took the bus this week? That is the entire audience. Uh, to Marcus at the MTA on the Upper East Side, we love our buses. Uh, and who here took the subway today? And so we, we, we are multi-transit users. Uh, and so we, we rely on our subways too. Who took the 456? Who's still riding the 456? Okay, that's about half the folks. How many of you took the Q train? And how many people had to wait the full eight minutes for that Q train to show up? <laughs> that happens to me every single time. I missed the train almost every single time. Uh, and so we're hoping to get a little bit faster than that in eight minutes. Uh, so uh, Marcus will talk a little bit about some of the uh, service changes, and then uh, we have a stack of questions that he is holding, and he will do his best to answer as many as he can. Uh, we're, we're running pretty late. Uh, we still have the Parks Department to present after this, so uh, is, is it okay if we run a little bit past 8 p.m.? Yeah, sure. Okay, so we'll probably do uh, MTA, if you don't mind, if speaking with Marcus for about answering questions for 10 to 15 minutes, and then we'll ask the same from Parks Department. So if you want to come up, if you can please welcome Marcus. He is spending his night with you. Thank you, Councilman. Um, welcome, uh, Upper East Side residents. Um, louder, yes. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a little overview. Um, we have a new transit president. His name is Andy Byford. And Mr. Byford has a pretty ambitious plan to modernize the subway and bus system. And I think a lot of what he's attempted to initiate will address a lot of the issues that I've heard over the years regarding uh, the bus system in Manhattan. So if we can put up the presentation, I'll do this little overview on the fast forward plan, and then I'll be willing to take your questions. accessible stations, which is critical and important. 
to have a state approved repair work at more than 150 subway stations. Over 1,200 CBTC equipped cars. CBTC is a computer based train control, which is currently on the L line right now. Um, this plan would also involve redesigning the bus, bus routes in all five boroughs and adding 2,800 new buses. In the following five years, so that's the first five years, that's what the plan um, seeks to deliver. In the following five years, we would have a state of, of the art signal system on another additional six lines, 130 additional stations made accessible, a state of good repair work at another 150 stations. If you have heard about the enhanced station initiative, we've been doing some uh, repair work and bringing some stations to a state of good repair um, already in, uh, in the subway system. We would also add an additional 3,000 new subway cars and 2,100 new buses. So the plan is to reform the track of the subway system. We would launch a new station manager program, which is underway right now. Our station manager program, essentially, you'd have a manager who would be responsible for a cluster of stations, top to bottom responsibility for everything that goes on in those stations. And you would be able to, their number, information would be there, you'd be able to contact, reach out to them, and share your concerns, and they would be responsible for addressing it. Um, we will attempt to reduce subway delays by 10,000 per month, focusing on operational basics, and developing a better root cause analysis for incidents involving delays. We also seek to enable the completion of more work faster. Currently, if you know over the years we've graduated from a station rehabilitation taking four years to now taking six months, and we've been successful with that. And last, uh, complete stable, complete stabilization phase of the current and active subway action plan. And the subway action plan occurred after the whole state of the emergency for the governor and they instituted some, some immediate action uh, items to address that. So we want to reimagine also the bus network, which this is important to this uh, constituency. This plan would look to redesign the bus network in all five boroughs in the next three years. Currently, right now, tonight is the first workshop in the Bronx. The Bronx will be the first to get a uh, bus redesign. Tonight's the first workshop, and there'll be several others to follow, taking input from our customers on what that would look like, what would work best, and uh, we'd like to do that in, in all worlds within the next few years. Um, this would require um, effective traffic enforcement in coordination with DOT, and give buses a greater priority with targeted corridor improvements. So working again with DOT to make targeted improvements in specific corridors to, to create flexibility. Right now, things are pretty, pretty clogged. We'd like to speed up boarding. That started with the SBS um, service, and we we'll continue to add features to that to uh, speed up uh, the boarding process, manage better for reliability, and enhance our world-class food. Uh, we'd also pilot and all continue to pilot all electric buses. We have a pilot program currently underway right now. I believe on um, 42nd Street, I think there's an electric bus. I have, uh, I asked one of my colleagues, Mr. William Brown, to come. He's with road control. So he's the eyes on the street. He knows what's going on um, with the buses on the street. So that pilot movie is, is on 42nd Street? Wait, the electric bus? Yes. Yes. 42nd Street. So that's probably a pilot program. We have to figure out, you know, electric buses in its current form is not, we have to test its ability to operate efficiently in the city of New York. You know, these things have to be charged, and how do we do that? We get the buses back on the road so that we are maintaining the schedule. Accessibility. Part of fast forward program on accessibility, all stations, and this is a goal of the transit president, 
all subway riders would be no more than two stops away from an accessible station. That currently doesn't exist today, and that's the goal that we're going to shoot for. More direct accessible ride routes. Right now, we get complaints about accessible ride taking securitous routes throughout the five boroughs before a person can get home. We're looking to streamline that and redesign that as well. Uh, implement a new My Accessible Ride app to make, you know, to bring uh, the system up to uh, the current uh, state of technology and enhance training for all our employees so we do a better job of communicating with our employees and people who use the service. And last but not least, uh, customer service and communication. Um, I think we all we need to do a better job, everyone needs to do a better job in listening and commit and follow through on what we say we're going to do. We would provide a quarterly uh, commitments report we're doing that currently in 2018. It's basically a customer commitment to our customers, and we would lay out quarterly what those commitments would be, and the following quarter, see where we are. Um, increase customer service training, and of course, improve community engagement. So far, the products we've made in 2018, we've launched our first quarterly customer commitment report. Uh, which you can find on the MTA website, mta.info. We installed hundreds of digital screens featuring service information, countdown clocks, and maps. We released an My MTA app to better deal with the uh, younger folks in technology and cell phones. We're installing PA systems at 13 stations that currently don't have them. It's pretty incredible that there are actually stations that don't have PA systems, but they are. And um, we're looking to, and this is important, reduce metro car claim processing by, by 70%. Right now it takes quite a bit of time to uh, process a claim on a metro car. So that's an overview of the uh, of Fast Forward program. If you're interested in going into it in detail, it's on our website, getmta.info. It's on the landing page. And uh, there's a much more extensive uh, breakdown of what all of that means. So I think that there are good things coming. Again, I'll go back to what it's going to take. It's going to take time. It's going to take political support. And it's going to take funding. Uh, but we are committed to make this happen. So now I will take questions. I have a few. I'm sure there are more. One more. So the first question is, why are there over a dozen time and date clocks on the new Second Avenue subway platforms and no countdown clocks. And as part two of that question, why do bus station signs list SBS only and when will the 96th Street and Second Avenue sign be fixed? Okay, um, I'll start from the bottom, 92nd Street and Second Avenue. When you say the sign, I'm thinking you're talking about the, the standard kiosk on the street. Those are maintained by DOT, but I will share with DOT that it's not operational and they need to get fixed. DOT means all of the street furniture in New York. They're responsible for the bus stops, shelters, the street primarily. Sure. So uh, the bus clocks won PV my first year in office to the tune of six hundred thousand uh, dollars. After we won, every other elected official in the city put money into it to the tune of I think four million dollars. The mayor then decided he wanted to match us for another four million. That being said. When I go past those bus blocks, they are usually blank. This is something I brought up with Andy Byford, the president of NYC Transit, who agreed that this was a problem, even if it was DOT, that we're going to work with MTA and he was going to make it happen. That being said, the good news is I'm a software developer. I figured out a way to get all the Lake NYC kiosks in our district working. I'm trying to work on using that to fix every single bus clock in the city myself. So, um, second avenue subway and countdown clocks. Here's the thing with countdown clocks. This technology is very solid on the uh, number lines, the IRT. They, some time ago, were wired internally from the tracks. So the, the trains, as they travel over the tracks, there's readers that let you know where the train is. 
all of the IOD stations, those are the, the leaded lines, which the Q is, uses a different technology because we wanted to get this big push to get that in the system. People wanted it, and we had to develop something, and that system operates on a beacon system which uses Wi-Fi. It's a little different, and we experienced some problems close to the terminals, and you're pretty close to the terminals at 96th Street and 86th Street. So that's, a, that's an ongoing process. We're working on fixing that, um, and as soon as we do, those countdown clocks will be operational. Uh, why are there over a dozen time? Okay, we just talked about that. Oscillation signs. Okay. Next one. Um, the New York City subway system has a lower on time rate than Mexico City. Do you think that spending money on MT employees to tell people to have a nice day by the turnstiles is really a good use of funds? You really think your person, my, my pension benefits are sustainable? Um, yes and yes. Uh, as was laid out in the uh, fast forward program, we're looking to enhance all aspects of the subway and bus system. That includes customer service, customer communication, as well as um, internal employee communication. So I, I think that we're moving in that direction. Yes. Want to say something? Uh, first item, when I was running for office, we used to have booths in our subway stations. And when you got in and out of the subway, there was somebody there. MTA actually moved those folks out of the booths, and I, I spent quite a lot of time working with MTA to make sure we keep a, a human presence in all of our stations. And uh, so that, I, I think it is worth our money to keep people on there, so I'm grateful that the MTA agrees on that. Uh, another interesting fact, I'm an ERISA attorney, Employee Retirement Income Security Act attorney. We have $13 trillion retirement debt in our city, in our, in our country. That means that over the next couple of years, more people will be retiring without a pension than people who will be. And it's going to cost us $13 trillion for Medicare, Medicaid, food stamps, and everything that it will take to care for this generation that didn't have a pension. And so any employer that is not providing a 401k or a pension is irresponsible, and they are engaging in corporate welfare. And so I'm glad that the MTA provides a pension. Okay, this question I think is, was answered by the presentation that I just did, which basically says is why the MTA and why the MTA is still using 20th century signal in 2018. We're, we're looking to turn that around. No, no doubt about it. Absolutely right. Okay, so the bus stop at 79th Street, First Avenue. This stop is dangerous. Buses stop in the middle of the street, not at the curb because they're is bypass and shift um, danger from something falling. Bus stop should be moved across the street. Mr. Brown, um, I showed him this before it came up. He's going to get on it right away to determine and assess what's going on there and make the necessary adjustments. Uh, and just as a, a follow up, uh, please make sure. So it's one thing to come and, and make sure your, what, you, what you are concerned about gets heard. But if you want follow-up and incremental updates, please make sure that as you're headed out, that you tell somebody that you asked a question, you got an answer, the answer is going to require follow-up, and give our office your name and information so that we can work with you and the MTA to get you the follow-ups. Because I, I believe, Marcus, that they're going to be on the 79th and 1st construction issue. But I also know that tomorrow morning it won't be changed yet, and that it will actually take time to move the bus stop, and then once the construction is done, it will take time to move it back. So we just want to work with you since you care, so that we can get you those updates once a week or every two weeks, or as that project moves forward. Okay, this is a long-standing uh, ask, and. Um, Again, I, I think that we have kind of answered this question in a number of, well, it's really the same answer. You know, SPS, this is, the question is, 
the select bus stop at 72nd Street and 1st and 72nd Street and 2nd Avenue. People are complaining for every five select buses, only one regular bus comes. Okay, um, again, right now, currently, you know, since what we're, where we're going because we're looking to redesign the bus network in, in Manhattan. Um, the current system is buses are assigned and uh, deployed based on ridership. We can, as an agency, currently provide equipment where there is not the ridership to support it. So what happens in a situation where you introduce a nice, fast uh, SPS route is the ridership goes up on the SPS and the ridership goes down on the wall, which is occurring. But again, bus network redesign, we're going to take a look at all of these routes and fix what's broken. Okay? So that's the story with that. Okay, there is extensive building on the Upper East Side, especially new towers. Despite the population increase, the MTA has been considering cutting back on buses for example, the 31 York Avenue, um, and it's given frequency. What is being done to accommodate population growth and increase ridership? This all falls, again, you have to take a hard look at what we have and how to improve it. Um, we don't turn a blind eye to population growth. It's part of the planning process, and um, we, we, we would address it. Um, you can't put service out there now and it's not, the development's not complete. The people are not there. So, obviously, uh, it would happen when the population and the ridership wanted to. Do you know when the east side access will be available for those of us with family on Long Island? Um, unfortunately, I, the uh, east side access falls under a different division in the MTA. The MTA is a parent company of a number of different agencies, including the Long Island Railroad. I don't have an answer to that, but if you share that question with uh, the councilman, I'm sure we can get an answer to that. Since the Crosstown bus is the only way to get to the Upper, East, Upper West Side through Central Park, can this service be enhanced? The answer is, again, with the bus network redesign, we're looking to enhance that which will require an and it's any more questions? My MTA is terrible. No bus time, no subway time, Metro North really bad. Look for Danbury, Grand Central, and it shows New Haven why. Emergency technology, we are, and of course we have, we have a, a, a population that's growing and changing, and the demand for this technology is, is constant. We're doing the best we can to get it out there as we go. Excuse me. Thank you. Um, as we go along, we're going to have to make improvements, refine these, these apps so they can do a better job. Um, but I will take this information. This is, this is an opinion that's valuable. I mean, some people may think it's great. Some people don't think it's so great. But still, I'm sure it needs improvement. So I will make sure that the folks who uh, do that that stuff for us will get this. On evenings after 8 p.m. and weekends, less traffic, there is greater need for more local buses versus select buses. Is that a possibility? Again, the driver currently is rushing. So if in fact there is a demand for more local service, we will absolutely put it there. Now, I just want to just note, you know, in previous years I've come, we've had service adjustments on routes. We do an annual uh, look at different routes to determine whether or not the, the, the level of service meets with the equipment and demand we have out there. I've noticed that the last two picks, the last two uh, service adjustments that we shared with the councilman's office, that there were no reductions. First time in a long time. So I, I think this is in concert with our taking a look at this whole 
bus system and determining what's best. So we're not making, to my knowledge, I don't believe we make any reductions to any of the uh, cross-town buses on the other side. What's up with MTA benches on sidewalks looking into empty storefronts or chain store windows or other sites with negligible <coughs> The uh, benches that are, uh, the benches as uh, Marcus said are DOT. Uh, if there's any bench that is in bad condition or is not in a place that you think is useful and you have another place on the block that would be useful, please work with our office. If you want to do it on the internet, you can just go to benkalos.com slash livable dash streets. Uh, but we're happy to work with you to get a bench wherever you want. It is helpful if you are able to work with the building. Uh, if they want it, it's easier to get it done. If they don't, it's a little harder. Okay, I, I want to thank you for hearing me. I, I, I think um, we have something to look forward to going forward. You know, um, and again, through the councilman's office, through your senator's office, through your assemblyman's office, the little woman's office, uh, we're available to address the concerns that you have. Well, thank you. Thank you for having us. Thank you. I want to thank uh, Marcus and his uh, colleague for joining us this evening. It appears that he came even though he may have been sick, so I'm grateful. Uh, and we hope that you can take some sick time and feel better. Uh, and uh, I'll just say that we've got some great folks at Community Board A to the Transportation Committee, and we're using new data to analyze the buses and make sure that they're working great. I, I will tell you that after fighting service cuts for the past four years, it is good to hear we don't have more coming. And we are working and uh, I'm hoping to... Uh, so, um, Marcus is going to take the questions with him. If uh, you need follow, please make sure to share that as you check out. Uh, we're going to continue. I've been able to get select bus service on M79. Uh, we're able to get it with M86, we're hoping to get it on M96, and we're going to continue working with our borough president and almost every other elected official to continue that rollout. Uh, now, the Upper East Side, my district in particular, is among the uh, districts with the least parkland per capita. That's in part because uh, our district is just so dense. And so we've been working to uh, improve the uh, park space in our district and to expand it. Now the question is that you what, what happens if you try to improve parkland uh, in a place where there's really no space and what you end up with is a two hundred million dollar investment over five year, four and a half years. Uh, most that, that's almost a a quarter of a billion dollars, most elected officials measure their success in hundreds of thousands or millions. It's good to be able to start measuring in, in portions of a billion. Now, we, we don't do it alone. We raise money, we advocate, but our partner is in the uh, Parks Department, particularly uh, Commissioner Bill Castro, and uh, working with him day in, day out, our Congress member, Carol Maloney, and our East River Espelon Task Force, which we co-chair together. and. He's been able to be an advocate with the uh, administration fighting for every dollar, and I've been able to do that same and in partnership. We've done so much, and we've been able to work with folks like uh, Rockefeller University, Hospital for Special Surgery, the Friends of the East River Esplanade to really rebuild our Esplanade. Uh, we've built Friends of groups at places like John Jay Park. We've supported uh, St. Catherine's Park. And our goal is to really have a friends of group and partnership at every single park in our district. If you have a park that you think needs one, we're happy to work with you. Uh, if you can join me in welcoming our, uh, we saved the best for last, our Manhattan Commissioner for uh, Parks Department, Bill Castro. Good evening. Good evening. And, uh, is this what I move? To move it around? I don't know. Yeah. Yes, it is. Okay. 
Uh, all right, so um, this is your district. And, uh, you know, you've got a few parks, uh, but the councilman is right. Uh, not enough. Uh, and that's why I'm so glad that he's worked with us, but he's really led the way in increasing uh, the ability of people to really use these regress plans. It's really made a, tr a tremendous difference. My wife and I go down there uh, on a regular basis, uh, and it was so hot this summer, right? And so we'd go there in the morning or the evening, and the newly renovated sections uh, north of uh, Andrew Haswell Green at 61st Street uh, that he really led the way on really have made a difference, and uh, I'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, here is uh, last November, we opened a beautiful new sitting area with a large lawn and shrubs. The lawn is really very, very nice, I recommend it to you. The old uh, heliport pavilion, as we know it, now known as Andrew Haswell Green Park, uh, leading light of the uh, city back in the late 1800s. Uh, somebody you should uh, find, out, find out about a little bit. He was a fascinating guy. Um, and this is up the ramp from York Avenue and East 60th Street. Uh, there are great views of the East River, Roosevelt Island, the tram goes overhead, Queensboro Bridge, uh, Koch Bridge. The funding for this $3.5 million project was provided by Councilmember Talos and Borough President Brewer and others, and it's, it's really quite a nice place to be. There you go, see? You can even practice your putting there, I think, if it's on the line. Uh, it's really very, very nice. Um, now, phase two of 2B is going to be a um, two sloping lawns where people just just north of that uh, the photo that I showed you, just sort of you know just a few feet north, where people will be able to relax, um, have a picnic if, if they would like to, but mostly people will probably just get out there, enjoy the sun, and relax, enjoy the view of the river. Uh, the piles that support the esplanade at this point have really become severely deteriorated over the last 20 years and will be totally reconstructed. This is a $25 million project. It's a significant project. It's being handled by the New York City Economic Development Corporation. And the design work is nearly completed, so that's, that's great. Uh, uh, next Thursday, uh, there is going to be a presentation of a minor change in the design presented to the Parks Committee, if you're willing to come out. Should be interesting, and uh, this is something we can all look forward to. There'll be some disruption, obviously, in the, the construction phase, but uh, once it's finished, it'll really be a magnificent uh, park for people. Uh, here, this was last December. We celebrated a, a substantial completion of the 81st Street pedestrian bridge. The project was overseen by the Department of Design and Construction. And we're working on a few punch list items uh, that we have to, uh, the plexiglass uh, um, side that gives you a real view, so the picture window uh, the size wasn't quite, quite right, so they're replacing that. Um, but that will be installed shortly, and uh, we're pleased about that. It's really um, a really great looking bridge. All right, now on to the East River Esplanade. Um, I, I really need to give credit to Councilor Michaelos for his role in arranging for the renovation of the two sections recently by local uh, health institutions. Uh, as he spoke about, Rockefeller University renovated uh, the section. It's really beautiful, too, alongside its campus from 63rd to 68th Street at a cost of $15 million by Rockefeller University pay for extensive repairs to the seawall, as well as improvements to the esplanade. And there are great trees and plantings, there's irrigation. It's really beautiful. It's, it's really the way it should be designed uh, for other sections. Uh, there's a fair amount of space at that location, the width of it. In other areas, it's not quite so wide. That's the limiting factor of these river esplanade, unfortunately. So you see, and uh, there's irrigation in, in those uh, areas. And they are required to maintain it. That was the other thing that the council member insisted upon, that Rockefeller University has to maintain it as well, in perpetuity. You see more pictures of it. It's really, really very nice. And the shade is very important to have, as the trees mature, it will bring welcome shade. 
Now, just a little bit further north, 70 to 72nd Street, we see here the Hospital for Special Surgeries renovation. Um, Councilmember Kalos uh, really worked with them to have that happen. And right in the middle where the dotted line is, we will soon be starting a one and a half million dollar renovation uh, through funding that the council member allocated. Um, the reconstruction will include, as the others, asphalt hex pavers, new benches, plantings, and new irrigation. He's also funded irrigation uh, to be installed further north at 90th Street, going north uh, for the rest of the Esplanade, which is uh, very, very welcome. 68th Street, and that's sort of a, a look at what it will look like. Uh, moving a little bit further north at Carl Schurz Park, the playground uh, is almost ready to start. It will include new play equipment for ages uh, 2 to 5 and 5 to 12. Uh, swings, seating, game tables, new spray shower area, pavements, plantings. The sandbox will remain, the existing sandbox. And we're creating a better connection to the Catbird playground at the north end by removing some fences between the two playgrounds. So $3.3 million project provided by the council member and, and for President Gail Brewer. And uh, we're very much looking forward to sort of the renovation of this part of Crossroads Park. Now, that's not all, as they say. Uh, Parks has been working with council member to bring new light to Rupert Park, uh, just on 2nd Avenue. It's uh, uh, near the uh, housing that was built a number of years ago on the old Rupert uh, Brewery uh, site. He's been sponsoring concerts there in conjunction with the Muslim Volunteers for New York. This is a really great organization. Uh, they have been working with us for the last year or two. And they do cleanups. They bring about 100 people each time. Uh, and uh, they've been doing this consistently now with us. And we'll be continuing. We, we look to make some renovations here. Uh, to improve it, here's one of the concerts, as you can see. And an Andrew Heswell Green uh, jazz concert earlier this summer. A family fun day at John Jay Park, and a lot of uh, good things. That we have a senior uh, fitness program, the Councilman Funds. It's really great to encourage you to get involved in that. Um, a lot going on in John Jay, and a lot more will be happening there as well. And uh, there's John Jay again. And then up at Stanley Isaacs, uh, uh, a roller skating night. Uh, kids are having a good time. The surface was redone by the roller hockey rink group. It looks very good. So there's a lot going on in the district areas. And uh, a few more. There's the Muslim volunteers. who've done a great job. Um, what we're doing in this district, and I'll, I'll finish up and uh, take a few questions, is um, we're making a lot of improvements to the, the parks and playgrounds through capital renovations. We're expanding the quality of them. Um, and what we're doing is building more community groups to help participate uh, and more programming. One of the key things you want to have, New York City is sort of a big, bad uh, city to some extent. Uh, if you're in parks and recreation, you see uh, smaller communities, and they have a whole range of programs in their parks. Well, now, thanks to what Parks is doing and the council member and the volunteers, we're trying to create fully evolved parks where you've got them renovated, you have programming and events, and things that really serve the community. And I'll be spending a lot of time this year working with Board 8 and some of the community folks to bring more uh, facilities, so to speak, um, little tennis courts. We've done that in John Jay. Thank you. Uh, we're going to do that in some other places, or perhaps volleyball or, or fitness programs, uh, so that if you live in the east side, uh, you can, you'll have a range of activities that you can uh, participate in, walking clubs, what have you, and I want to learn more about what the community is looking for, and then we'll try to provide them in different uh, parks in the district. So with that, I'll stop and take questions. So do you have I have. All right. We cannot get any city agency to take ownership of the small park at the end of East 72nd Street. It has become dangerous and unsightly. Why will no agency help? Uh, I don't know. Uh, first I'm hearing of it. Um, 
I know what you're talking about, the area, but it's not uh, a park. Uh, but I take it that it's uh, not in great shape and it's being ignored. That's correct. All right, well, let me, I'll go take a look at it and see what I can uh, figure out. We've tried to talk to your organization, talk to every park in the city, every department of the city, and no one wants it. It's all this. Uh -huh. You can't get anybody to do anything. It's, it's a private property. So what? So what we'll, what we'll do, so there's a pocket. So at the end of 72nd Street, there's an overlook of the uh, East River. So we will uh, work with you, Parks Department. Um, and uh, so we have your information, but if you can sign in, uh, we'll work with, if you can make sure to say hi to Tierso on your way out, we'll touch base with you, we'll work with you, we'll work with Department of Transportation, so I'll bring in the City Council's Land Use Division. We will look at your deed records if you do not mind. We will identify where the tax, lot, tax lots end, and we will figure out legally who is responsible. And that being said, regardless of that, it sounds like you care about the space, and there's a group of townhouses there, and then there's a very large, uh, expensive condo uh, with a driveway that uses that space so we can see if we, regardless of ownership, just see if we can take custodianship and ownership. But because that area actually has the cobblestone, I'm almost sure that there is an agreement between the city and somebody to maintain that area. It expired. It was with the solo building and it expired. Sounds like you, you know more than me, so it looks, so, so we're happy to work with you, so long, we're happy to see if we can get folks to be good custodians and good neighbors, and uh, we'll do our best. Just so you know, we were told that we're not allowed to touch that park or we become legally liable we will, for anything. We will, we will continue to work with you. I want to thank everyone who's been incredibly gracious in just following the question card format so everyone can get their chance. Back to Commissioner Cashman. All right, very good. Thank you, Councilman. Uh, when will the Esplanade be repaired? Uh, and completely reopened. Why is it now closed off at the Marine Transfer Site? That's at 90th Street, uh, a little bit north of there. What's being done about the portion of the S plot from north of 96th Street? Um, the uh, work that's being done, uh, there are a couple of things. One is the Marine Transfer uh, Site. Um, I don't have the answer on, but soon that should be relevant. I guess, the, I think this fall. Uh, I'll have to double check, but I believe that's information there. There's also a second project that's going on just south of it at Carl Schurz Park. Uh, this is a uh, $6.8 million seawall reconstruction uh, that should be finished uh, at the end of this year, so in a few months. Uh, so then that will be reopened around that time. Uh, north of 96th Street, uh, there are a number of uh, capital projects that will be going on to repair the Esplanade north of 90th Street as well. Uh, we have a $15 million project and a $26 million project. Uh, some of that is for south of there and some of it is for north. There are a couple of sites, 114th Street, 117th Street, 124th, 125th. Ex uh, construction is supposed to start um, this winter or fall. Um, so that's good news. And uh, Mayor de Blasio also put in the budget $60 million for additional uh, reconstruction work of the Esplanade between 60th and 125th Street in the newly adopted budget this summer. Will Andrew Haswell Green Park get uh, uh, no public toilets? Security cameras. Cameras? I'll, I'll jump in. Uh, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, I think I know who asked that question. I'm guessing that's uh, Green Park Gardeners. Yes, sir. Uh, we're working on it. We hope to have some good news to announce very soon. Uh, you should make sure to stop by and see Abby, and uh, we will work with you on figuring out some uh, a good date to have a conversation about. It. Thank you for the advocacy. No public toilets from Carl Schurz Park to 24 Sycamores Park. Well, they're, they're as given homeless population, runners, bikers, uh, 
Uh, they're going to the bathroom in the park. Well, there's there are bathrooms at Carl Schurz Park and 24 Civil Wars. Right, but there's nothing in between. Yeah, John Jay. John Jay yeah. is in between. There, there? there are bathrooms 24. there. 24 Civil Wars is a child park. Yes, but uh, it doesn't matter. It's, adults are allowed in it if there's a comfort station. So you, you can you can Including use that. Including homeless people? Excuse me? Including homeless people? Homeless people are people. <laughs> yes, ma'am. So you're aware of what's going on from 60th to 64th Street in terms of defecation on people? No, I'm not, but I'd be happy to talk to you about it. Happy to. Okay, so, yeah. great. Uh, so let me just make sure. So a I, I, I key thing here is we're, we're hoping to work with and one of the reasons we did the DHS presentation is we're hoping to work with custodial groups like yours, like Green Park Gardeners, where if you should happen to know the folks. So on 72nd Street on the Esplanade, there's a gentleman who, who usually has a wrap on his foot. His foot looks a little bit larger, and uh, it, it's clear he often needs medical attention. So if you know who this person is, how often he's there, when he happens to be there, we can work with DHS. We can work with folks who may know them, who may bring them a coffee in the morning that they know they're going to be there when they're walking their dog or whatnot to build a relationship and use that relationship to get them the help they need and to try to find a bathroom for them that they can use. I, I will tell you that every hospital in this part of the district has a public bathroom. And I, I also know that those bathrooms are also available to people who are homeless. But the, and we've got the, the we have uh, walks, we, we have a lot of resources for folks who are looking for a bathroom uh, beyond just Starbucks, so we're, we're happy to work with you. And that being said, yours is not the first request for more bathrooms along the Esplanade. I can get it a lot anytime I am running on the Esplanade north of 96th Street. Uh, there are even fewer comfort stations, and I think one of the larger questions is trying to get a comfort station on the Esplanade so we, we, we hear you loud and clear. And, uh, we will try to see what we can do, uh, but one thing we will try to work with you on is trying to find a way to make it clear to folks that the Esplanade is not a place for people to do anything that they wouldn't want to do and uh, that, that folks would not welcome in their own backyard. Right. What about benches between 81st and Carl? There was a third question on that card. Uh, yeah, I know. I'm coming to it. Okay. All right. Thanks. What about benches between 81st and, excuse me. What about benches between 81st and Carl Schurz? Uh, I guess you mean along the uh, Esplanade there? Yes. Yes. Uh, we'll take a look at that. Seems reasonable. Um, now Wait, get back to the. Sorry, no, hold on. Let me, let me finish for a second. The uh, Andrew Haskell Green Park is still not properly listed in 311. That was your third question, I believe. Uh, I don't know why that is, but we'll be happy to take a look at that. Um, Sound walls for the new area south of Andrew Haswell Green. Uh, we'll take a look at that as well. Um, and then the last question was the oval. Um, question mark and two exclamation points. Um, well, I don't know exactly what the question is, but I think I can guess. The, uh, we have extended the uh, license agreement for a year, which we're allowed to do uh, for the tennis courts uh, there as we evaluate the request for proposals. And when we have more information on that, we'll certainly uh, let the council member know and, uh, and the community board and the community. So those are the questions that I have. Thank you, council. Thank you. I want to thank our Manhattan Borough Commissioner, uh, Bill Castro, for coming out this late at night uh, to have conversations with the community. Uh, on John Finley Walk from 84th Street, Carl Schurz Park, down to 81st Street. There are no benches. We worked with Civitas on a visioning for that part of the Esplanade, and the enormous feedback we got was that the overhang was not welcome, and so we were able to work with Greerly to put over $1 million into renovations there. Uh, in the conversations we had with the community, uh, and, and Everything's actually available at bencalos.com. Uh, just search for Rearly and we'll, or Civitas. We have the whole presentation. We got over 150 responses. We did multiple public meetings. Uh, the community was not interested in seeing that become a passive recreation space. 
uh, but rather keeping it to be a, a transitory space. I understand the desire to extend the benches further south. I think it's a matter of uh, getting it one step closer at a time so the Brearley improvements will bring plantings and greening and water to the Esplanade. Uh, we're hoping to work with the Parks Department to repair some of the pooling and puddles and just get that into a first class space and then as people get more accustomed to using it. Uh, we're, we're nearing the end, we're actually a little bit over on time. Uh, at one point we had about uh, 60 to 70 folks. It's a big room so it can feel small but I want to thank everyone for coming. Uh, we're so gracious, we were so lucky to be joined by our state senator Liz Kruger, our assembly member uh, Rebecca Seawright. And uh, there's a, an elected official who I look up to quite a lot. I want to be her when I grow up. Uh, she's our Manhattan Borough President, Gail Brewer. She is uh, one of the folks that you may have heard me say that uh, whenever I'm nervous about doing something and I need a little courage, it is she and Liz Kruger who stand side by side with me. Uh, the senator uh, chastised me a little bit for saying that we were up to no good, so I'll just say we're always up to good. Uh, it's just that other people may not appreciate it, specifically real estate. So if you can join me in welcoming our Manhattan Borough President, Gail Brewer. October. So there are just a lot of uh, challenging issues and I want to thank the community board, all of you, the council member for trying to weigh in and solve some of these problems. I've just come from a good thing, we just came from the South Street Seaport and Waver Tree of course is a beautiful boat. If you haven't been on it, you should. It got renovated to sat down. So when you see something like that, you feel overjoyed to be a New Yorker. And then you can get confronted with you know, some of the challenges that we have. But your council member works hard. You do too. I do the best I can to back them up, to come up with ideas, and to find a way that we can solve some of these problems. So thank you for being here. Um, we're working on all of them. Uh, I, I know that everything is supposed to be supposed to prioritize you. Know? I hate doing this. I want to work on all the issues that you care about. So thank you for being here. It means a lot to him, to me. And uh, we need you. Thank you. Okay, there were a bunch of questions that were actually just for me. Uh, so the, there's two questions on construction. Uh, one relates to after hours variances, which is the fact that construction companies work past 6 p.m. sometimes and on weekends. And another one is about lights. With regards to lights, uh, I see this is about 57th Street. Uh, it says West 57th Street. Uh, that being said, uh, we don't have a name on this, but if you work with our office, if you let us know, we'll uh, work with you. We'll, we'll probably work with our borough president, since she's here, to see if we can approach the developer to say, do you mind turning off the lights at night to help the environment. We also work with folks at the construction site has the lights pointed into your windows. We work with them to point them in the right direction. And uh, we have had limited success. Neil Brewer and I have done a lot with our senator and others to try to stop the Department of Buildings from granting after hours variances. It's a variance, which means they're not supposed to grant it every day. It seems that the variance is when they don't grant it. Uh, but we've been successful occasionally, so if there's specifics locations. So this is about 86th in New York, so um, we're happy to work with you. If you don't mind just sharing your information with us, we will work, we'll keep trying, we'll see if we can get the developer to come to the table and be responsible. Uh, and we'll also send a letter to the uh, DOB, because they aren't being granted legally. Uh, we have a question from uh, Evan Z. Booker, who is leading an effort called MTS Repurpose. Uh, he's, uh, he'd like to know next steps, and I think we're working with him, we're happy to support him. I think he's had more audiences with the mayor of the city of New York, Bill de Blasio, who knows him by a first name basis at this point, than anybody else. I understand he's been talking to EDC about using it 
for a ferry stop, and I think uh, almost all the elected officials on the east side, if not all, are just happy to try to support him. But at this point, it seems he has just as much access as, as anyone else, if not more so. Uh, there's a question about the Uber bills and. Um, So the city council was, uh, the first time the city council considered doing an Uber cap, I was against it, I was able to defeat it. The second time the city council came back after doing a study that found that Uber wasn't actually causing the, all the traffic, I again said I don't think that this is going to do what you think it will do, I think it's just going to make it harder for everyone to get where they're going, and I was quite vocal about it. I did my best to negotiate with folks. and. What I found in life is you can find meaningful compromise. I had an opportunity to sit down with the leader of our body, our speaker, and I said, I'm really concerned that all of a sudden we're not going to be able to get where we're going, and that Uber's no longer, and, and their competition, we call it the Uber bill, but it's really about all the app-based companies. I said, I just need to get the car going, and if the subway doesn't work, I need to take a bus, and if the bus isn't there, I need a city bike, and if the city bike rack is empty, I need a yellow cab, and if it's raining and there's no yellow cabs, I need an Uber. Uh, and if Uber's doing surcharging, then I need a Lyft. And if Lyft's not there, I'm going to use a Via, but I'm just going to get where I'm going because I'm a New Yorker and we don't take no for an answer. Sometimes you might see me just like running down the street as fast as I can. And what they said was, if we see a huge negative impact, then they're open to revisiting it sooner than the one year. So what that means is if the wait times are going from four to eight minutes, uh, if you're finding it harder and harder to catch a four hire vehicle by app, just let us know and we'll uh, work with them. Uh, and in terms of congestion pricing, which is one of the questions along here, I'm in favor of it. It's something that the New York Times endorsed me for. I'm not in favor of just taxing people for the sake of raising money. I actually want to get cars off the road. So the plan that I've been talking to folks about is what if we just told everyone, two and a half million vehicles come to New York City every day, what if we told those folks? Because they used to have to pay taxes if you lived outside of New York City and worked here, but the assembly got rid of it. What if we just said if you drive here, you have to pay to come into, if you're coming from Nassau into Queens or if you're coming from Westchester into the Bronx. And guess what? It's not just congestion right here in Manhattan. It's congestion all over the city. You can't get anywhere. So if we did that, it would get about one third of the vehicle. It's a quarter to a third of the vehicles off the road, which actually gets people upset because instead of raising two or three billion dollars a year, we'd only raise one and a half to two billion dollars a year. But for me, it's about getting the vehicles off the road. I'm interested in working with folks. Uh, there's a question about uh, school construction. Uh, I I don't. I don't listen to the government as often as I probably should sometimes. And I don't take no for an answer. It's something I learned from Gail Brewer. And we were trying to, a lot of the schools, we have a crunch for space. We don't have playgrounds. And so the schools wanted to do use their rooftops, which is incredibly challenging. And so PS6 had done it. So I said, let's do it with every single school in my district. And we did it with PS290, 151, 217, and Eastside Middle School. And PS290, who we started with, had more challenges than anywhere else. The way the city works is we set aside all the money, we take out a loan, and then we use that loan to go in and do a scope to see how, how, how much is this actually going to cost. And the building's something like 100 years old. We didn't have the design. And so we are still trying to see what we can get done, if we can get things done. The mayor's office for people for disabilities is still trying to figure out whether or not we can legally do this. <laughs> and, uh, yes, it's... <laughs> the fly was here first, to, 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 to be fair. Uh, so we're continuing to work there. I think one of the frustrations is, I think you've started to see what we've been able to do when we activate our dollars. And so we've had several million dollars parked in these rooftop projects. We've been able to move some of them forward. But at the same time, we've been trying to do these rooftops. We've been able to open park after park after park and pre-K center after pre-K center. Uh, there's a question about the e-bikes. E-bikes are illegal. If you let us know uh, where there are e-bikes, we will work with the 19th Precinct to have them confiscated. Uh, they can't just show up and take them. They have to wait for somebody to get on a bike. We work with the East 72nd Street Neighborhood Association to do a survey. We're happy to do it with anywhere else. If you're part of another neighborhood association, we would like to expand the program. 
Does everyone remember when we used to ban menus from going being slid under doors? We would ban them from the building. What if we ban people from the building if they almost hit us on the way home? Uh, what if, we, if they're not wearing their vest, they can't deliver the food? So that's something we've been asking folks to do. Uh, I think, Gail, do you know if the, uh, so I believe the e-scooters are legal? Well, yeah, it ha if it's not licensed in Albany, licensable, the only thing that's, uh, then you cannot But like the e the e-scooters, the bird, no, the bird scooters that Chris? No, as long as they are, don't yeah. have, a, they have no license, they're not legal. The only thing that's legal is the assisted. Yes. Uh, People don't know what the assisted is. We can get this is. gentleman a quick card. Uh, and then the next question, what is the status on the throttle assist delivery bikes? So if it is a pedal assist, that is legal, but pedal assist means their legs are moving. If they're going 20 miles an hour and their legs aren't moving, that's an e-bike, that's illegal. Uh, city bike just rolled out a fleet of pedal assist vehicles. In terms of the person wrote here that they were concerned about there not being enforcement, I can tell you we actually do 10% of the enforcement here in this district. Uh, we wrote 14,000 moving violations in the 19th and 17th precinct to cars. That is 14,000 cars, many of them ran red lights, made illegal right turns or left turns, and failed to yield to pedestrians. And uh, we wrote a similar number of violations, about 1,400, so about 10% to uh, bikes. So I think those are, oh, uh, give me a second. I think those are all the questions. If you didn't get a chance to ask your question or we didn't get to it, uh, not on purpose. Uh, feel free to stop by our desk and you can work with somebody in our office to get you all the answers that you need. I want to thank folks who are watching on Facebook or YouTube. Thank you for joining us tonight. And I just want to thank all of you who came out tonight. And uh, we will see you at a ton of events uh, this September. And I just want to thank our uh, borough president who does not stop working ever. Thank you. Thank you.